Well, good morning, Bowie's Creek family. It is so good to have you joining us online this morning. Would you stand if you're able to and would like to and worship our Heavenly Father? Join us as we sing, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, as we sing today. Stand up, stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer, where duty calls or Stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To he who overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign. Well, good morning, Bowie's Creek First Baptist Church. Uh, we are coming uh, worship this morning from two places, one in Bowie's Creek, as you just recognized with Kyle, and also here in Kodiak, Alaska. This is the Kodiak Bible Chapel. We're so thankful to be able to come and preach this morning. Uh, this is a church Sarah and I got married in. This church played a, a pivotal role in my spiritual development, and so it's exciting to be here and preach uh, here at the Bible Chapel this morning, and also uh, to be able to worship with you all uh, at home as well. Just a couple of announcements as we begin worship today. First, I want to remind you that we have the angel tree children that are on the tree. We have a few more of those left. If you would like to have one of the children off the angel tree, you can either come by the church office and get that, or you can call and, and Patsy can get you set up with one of the children. We do need those gifts back by December the 15th, so if you can do that. Also, I want to remind you, next Sunday we're going to be kicking off officially our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and so we will give you more information about our goal and about all of the things that will be coming up. We will have our special time on December the 16th, which will be a drive-in this year. We'll be having a, a, a drive-in uh, night where we'll have a meal that we'll take to your car. You'll be able to watch some of the videos and other messages from uh, missionaries on the screen. We hope you'll come and be a part of that. Also want to remind you next week we will be back outside for our in gathering, our in person gathering at ten thirty. Mike Bort from the Baptist State Convention in North Carolina will be here to bring the message. So we hope you'll come and be a part of that. Uh, as we will still be here, we'll be making our way back home next uh, Sunday, and so we're so grateful. But it's good to be here. It's good to be in Alaska. A little colder than it is in Bowie's Creek, but it's great to all be together. Uh, Technology is great, especially in cases like this. I want to start. Uh, this morning, reading from John as we enter into this season of Christmas, John 1, 14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because He was before me. Out of the fullness we have received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. As we continue in our series on Galatians this morning, we'll finish that up. But we just want to also look forward with anticipation 
of the coming of Christ and the celebration of the Christmas season. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we come together and worship this morning, we just pray that, God, we would be faithful to give you our lives, that we would be willing to live in the Spirit, that we would be free in Christ. Today, God, as we finish up this book in Galatians, this letter that you had Paul write to the church in Galatia, Lord, may we be challenged, may we be provoked, may we be willing to commit our lives to you. We ask all of this in the name of now we're going to go back to Bowie's Creek, and uh, Kyle's going to continue to lead us in worship. We're just so thankful you're here this morning. Would you stand and join us as we worship our Father during this worship set as we sing, You are my all in all. Join us as we sing, You are my strength. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb. treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy that as scripture says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And it is only through the name of Jesus that we have power to be able to do the work that Christ has called us to do. It's not through our strength, it's not through our power, but through the power of the great name of Jesus Christ. So as we sing this song, let us worship him and praise him for his great name. Lost are saved, lost are saved, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has 
has to leave at the sound of your great name, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise your great name. All the weak, all the weak find their strength at the sound. souls receive grace at the sound of your great name the fatherless they find their rest at the sound of your great name sick are healed and dead are raised at the sound of your great name jesus worthy is the lamb that was slain for us the son of god and man you are high and lifted up and all the world will praise your great name, your great name. Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty, my Savior, Defender, you are my King. Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty, my Savior, Defender, you are my King, Jesus. The name of Jesus, you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise your great name, your great As we enter our prayer time this morning, as we do approach the Christmas season and this season of Lottie Moon Christmas offering and our, our focus on the mission of God around the world, we just want to pray for our missionaries. This has been a difficult time for many reasons, and we just want to lift them up in prayer. Uh, it is so um, helpful, I think, to our missionaries to know that there are churches all across our nation praying for them preparing to give to their work throughout this season. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, as we pray this morning, we pray for our missionaries. We pray, Lord, for those that have been affected greatly by this pandemic. Lord, for those that have been unable to get back into their country to which they've been called. God, for those that are here stateside, Lord, we just pray that you would just uh, give them patience. God, that you would continue to have uh, passion that you have placed in their heart for the people that they take the gospel to. God, we just pray that doors would be open, that, Lord, that the opportunities and the relationships 
and all the things that they were doing before this, God, that those would be restored and, Lord, your work would flourish around the world. As people are looking for hope, I pray that as we give, as we go, as we pray, that, God, we would be a part of your great mission. God, we're so thankful for the faithful who are willing to be called and to willing to go, to leave home and comfort, to go and share your gospel around the world. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. You have your Bibles this morning. If you'll open them to Galatians chapter six, we'll be we'll be finishing our uh, series on uh, the book of Galatians today. Uh, but as we turn there, we'll look at uh, the eighteen uh, verses there in chapter six. When I was a little boy, I, I learned to love bass fishing. It was one of the, my favorite things to do, and I remember the the guy who got me into bass fishing. He was older than I was. He was in high school and. 
Uh, his best friend was my best friend's brother, and uh, the four of us used to go bass fishing out in the lake behind their house, and uh, we just loved doing it. And I remember as he was teaching us and showing us how to bait our uh, our our hook with a worm and do all this stuff. I remember the first time we went out and really were trying to catch anything, and my friend and I started catching bass. And and uh, Eric and and my brothers, or my best friend's brother, hadn't quite gotten there yet. And I, I remember when they did get there, and I remember Eric came up, and like Eric was one of those people. He was like he was the guy we looked up to. He was the fishing man. He was the the bill dance, if you will. Uh, of, of just he was he was the man. And I remember he came up and he said, you guys catching anything? I said, we're catching a lot. We've been catching them. And I remember he took his hand and he, and he put his hand on my hand and he rolled over my hand and he, and he took my thumb and he took his finger and he rubbed it against my thumb and, and, and he did like this. He said, yep, you've been catching them. I said, what are you talking about? He said, when you pick up that bass and, and you've been holding it to get the hook out of his mouth, those little teeth will, will bite right into your thumb and it'll leave a mark. That you can always tell if a man's actually been catching fish because there's a mark there. This morning I want to ask you a question before we begin. I'll ask it again at the end. Do you have the mark of Jesus? You can always tell. Just like with the fish. Do you have the mark of Jesus? Galatians 6, beginning in verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry out each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one of you should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one of you should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instructions in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh... From the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. See what large letters I use to write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast uh, uh, except in the cross of Christ of Jesus, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to you all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you in your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Our freedom in Christ is personal, but the mission is communal. When someone doesn't live by the Spirit, what happens? We, we've looked at over the last couple of weeks, do you choose freedom in Christ or slavery? Do, do you, do you uh, walk by the Spirit of God? But what happens when someone doesn't? Do we simply discard them? Do we just say you're not worthy? You're not part of our fellowship anymore? No, we don't do that. Now, Paul wrote harsh words. We looked at that last week. He wrote harsh words for those trying to lead others away that I'd wish you'd just castrate themselves. Paul was saying, look, if you're going to lead all those people away, it'd be better for you not even to be a part of the fellowship. But this is not about that. This is about those being led down a path away from God. It's about the people who have chosen this path. Someone who chooses to indulge themselves and not please Spirit. 
Paul says, in that case, when someone has sinned, when someone has fallen, then the body, the church, has the responsibility for that person. You see, their decision to be free in Christ is personal. You know, we can't be saved communally. But the mission is communal. Our decision to follow Christ and to receive His righteousness is a personal decision. But the mission of God is communal. Paul gives this instruction, but he doesn't give it lightly because he knows the danger of it. He says, if someone is caught in sin, you who are living by the Spirit, you're the ones that should restore them. But do it gently. Two things here. Paul talks about who should do the restoration. And secondly, he says how they should do it. First, who? He says those who are walking in the Spirit. It has a communal responsibility, but it has to be someone who is faithful and walking in the Spirit of God. Now, uh, we, we see this, and Paul says we must carry the burden of each other. We must do this together. Now, this seems to contradict if we don't know the context here in verse 2 and verse 5. In verse 2, he says we need to carry the burdens of each other, one another. In verse 5, he says everyone should carry their own load. That's the ideal, that everyone would be walking in the Spirit. But Paul knows that everyone's not. So until they are, we all have to be in this together and carry the load together. People who are walking in the Spirit do not live in a bubble. You can't just walk in the Spirit and act as if none of this el- no, nobody else exists or you don't have any responsibility in the church. We have to be available. We have to be willing to restore others. That's part of what it means to be a mature follower of Christ. It's part of the reason why we have these disciple-making triads. Those who are walking in the Spirit, working together, three people, hopefully holding each other accountable and bringing each other up in the faith. That's the who, but also the how. Paul says it's to be done gently. Paul uses this in term in term instructor or teacher or it could also be one who disciples but Paul reminds everyone that there has to be a self-examination a teacher an instructor is one who sees or leads another person to this life-giving abundant way or understanding of Christ Paul does not intend for this how to be some critical judgment, rather a discipleship path. It's not an idea of just pointing out what's wrong. It's bringing someone along. Paul's desire for the Galatians is that each one would walk in the Spirit. And until that happens, it's going to require others to help people along in the journey. A church that takes people Not to to berate them, not to put them down. A church that takes people who are not walking in the spirit of the flesh, or not walking in the spirit, but walking in the flesh, and help them along the journey. That's what discipleship is. It's this gentle path of correction. It's this gentle path of bringing one back. Why do we do that? We do it, Paul then goes into this idea, because what we sow is what we will reap. Verse 7 here is taken out of context probably more than any other verse in Scripture. It says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. I have heard people take this verse, use it to explain terrible disasters. Terrible events. They'll they'll take it and they'll beat people up over this verse. Most of the time when it's being used, it's being used as if God's wrath is coming down on these people back over in chapter 5, verses 19 and 21. These people that are committing sins that are not our sins. We, We want to take it and we want to condemn people. But however, simply put, 
this verse, if we read it in context and we understand what's happening here in Galatia, when it says God cannot be mocked, in context, it means God's design cannot be altered by humankind. God's design is that if you plant a seed, whatever that seed is, the fruit of that seed is what we can expect for a harvest. You know, we would consider someone who plants a kernel of wheat and expects a soybean or a soy uh, plant to come up, a soybean plant, we would expect that person to be crazy. Why would a person put a kernel of wheat in the ground and not expect wheat? God did not design the wheat kernel to turn into a soybean plant or vice versa. Yet people often in their lives indulge themselves in the flesh. And then when they reap what they sow, it's almost this huge surprise of how did that happen? How did God allow that to happen? Why would God take me, who, who is kind of just hanging out doing my thing, why would God do this or allow this in my life? But probably even more true. We want a life that is abundant in Christ. We want a life that's in the Lord. And yet we live our lives for the flesh. And we wonder why we're not walking in step with God. We wonder why we're not reaping a harvest. We fill our minds full of stuff that have nothing to do with God. We fill our time on pleasures of this world. We use our resources chasing after our dreams. We use all of those things looking for our success. Fill in the blank, whatever that is in your life. We do that. We, we give everything to everything other than God, indulging in the flesh. And then we sprinkle in a little Jesus or a little church. I think everything's going to be okay. Paul says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. You're going to sow to the flesh. Paul says it'll lead to destruction. Listen, this may sound cruel, it may sound harsh, but if you spend your life sowing into the desires of your flesh, you cannot expect to, to reap anything other than destruction. Do not at least be surprised by that. Says if you'll sow to the Spirit, if you'll sow, please the Spirit of God, that eternal life from the Spirit is what we can expect to receive. It's really that simple. It's as simple as that whatever God designed the seed to be, if we plant that, if we sow that, that's what we will reap. We know that to be true in agriculture. Paul says it's true in the spiritual realm as well. And as we do this, Paul says there's three concepts here, and I want to share those with you as he's finishing off this part of the letter. First, it takes persistence. Paul says, let us not become weary in doing good. Paul says, don't become weary in doing good. That's a good thing. If we're truly living by the Spirit, let me warn you, you are going to be swimming upstream, not just in the world. We understand that. We talk about that. We kind of get that concept. But sadly, you will also be swimming upstream in the church. And there are going to be times in your life when you're trying to live sowing to please the Spirit, where you just get tired and you just want to give up, you just want to give in. The church in Galatia, the people in Galatia, I'm sure that the pressure, the burden, the heaviness of wanting them to be circumcised, to take on this law, was probably heavy. I'm sure the pressure got to them at times. I'm sure at times they probably thought it's just easier for us to give up. There are going to be times in your life where you're going to become weary and it's just going to be easier to give up. 
It's going to be easier just to go against your principles. It's just going to be easier to go with those that are pressuring you. It's just going to be easier to fit in. It's just going to be easier. Go along with whatever the easiest path is. Stop resisting. Stop fighting. Stop being persistent. Paul says, be persistent. Do not grow weary. Secondly, Paul says we have to have patience. He says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we harvest if we do not give up. You have to be patient. The crop may not come in. The internet service here in Kodiak as it relates to Verizon phones is not that great. And I'm used to, most of us are used to, we get out our smartphones, we look up something, and we want results right away. We want results as soon as we hit go. And when your system's a little bit slower, it's not compatible with the system you're in, it goes on and on and on and on. I was just looking up the other day what time a, a place opens and what time they close. And it took forever, and I found myself getting frustrated. And in our spiritual lives, we are like that as well. We think that if we plant something or we do something, and because we live in this instant society that we're going to reap that harvest right away. Give up. We don't persist. We're not patient. A personal story from our lives. Sarah and I had decided to have children and we began to have children. We had Andrew and then Luke. We had a lot of people who didn't like the way we raised our boys. For various reasons. People in the church, family, friends, sometimes even the boys didn't like the way we were raising the boys. And yet, we tried to sow to please the Spirit as we raised them. We wanted to teach them to love Jesus. We wanted our boys to love people, all people. We wanted them to be kind and we wanted them to be on the mission of God. We, we, we tried to instill that into them. And there were times where it was tough. But God is faithful. You see, if we are persistent, if we have patience as we live and sow to please the Spirit, God will be faithful for us to reap the harvest. Thirdly, there's persistence, there's patience, and there's people. Paul writes, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong in the family of believers. He doesn't say, do good to those who benefit us. He doesn't say to do good to those that we like. He doesn't say do good to those... Uh, who are convenient. God, Paul says, do good to all people, especially those in the church. Paul's saying, this is who we're supposed to be. Pleasing the Spirit, living, walking in the Spirit means that we value people because they're made in the image of God. Listen, as the church of all people, we should be people who are in the people business. We need to be lifting people up. We need to be helping them to understand and experience the love of God. We need to be people who, when other people see us, it is a good experience because we do good in sowing. Please the Spirit. The principle here is that what we value, we harvest. See, what we're willing to do, what we're willing to through persistence, patience, and people, what we're willing to do with our lives, that's what we're going to harvest. You want to throw your life away in sowing to indulge the flesh, whether that's all these sins that are listed over here in 5, 19 to 21, whether it's by putting yourself into things that have nothing to do with God, or whether it's giving yourself to things that are not what God wants you to do, you will reap destruction 
But if you value the things of God, if you sow to please the Spirit, in time you will see a harvest. Then Paul moves on to the last part of this letter and he gets personal. And he wants them to know, he wants the Christians in Galatia to know that freedom in Christ will cost you something. Paul wants to make it absolutely clear that people here understand that this path of freedom in Christ has cost him. It's cost him in many ways, but it's cost him physically. He says, see what large letters I use to write you in my own hand. Paul's writing them, reminding them, as he did earlier, about his eyesight. And as I think about this, and I studied about this week, and I thought about this, you know, why would God allow this to happen to somebody like Paul, who gave himself to the church, who gave himself to the Lord, who's been so faithful? But then I remember, what, 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 what if God allowed this to happen so that every time Paul was reminded that his eyesight was bad, he remembered that road to Damascus when he lost his eyesight completely. Life was transformed. Paul said it would cost something. It cost him. On the contrary, those who were the agitators, those who were the Judaizers, those that were selling this circumcision, Paul says they don't even follow the law. They aren't sacrificing anything. These are people in the church that want other people to do something, to accept part of the law, and yet they won't accept it themselves. Paul says they are only doing it about conversion. See, these people who wanted people to be circumcised, Paul made it clear that if you take on part of the law, you take on all the law. And they weren't willing to take on all the law, yet they wanted others and led them down a path that they were unwilling to go themselves. Paul said, I'm not going to boast about that. I'm not going to boast about converts. Paul says, the only thing that I want to boast about is the cross of Christ. The cross that was crucified. Crucified Paul to the world. Paul said, I've given up on that. I've given up on the world. I'm following Christ. Paul wants only Jesus. See, in this world, if you want to follow Christ, if you want to sow to please the Spirit... It is going to cost you something. Paul says that circumcision stuff, that uncircumcision stuff, it means nothing. The question here is, are you a part of the new creation? People who choose this path. Pay a price in this world. Unfortunately, I think because prosperity, preaching, and teaching has gotten into the church, this I'm going to demand my rights, uh, this whatever uh, I do has to benefit me, the church is about me, the church is, uh, God is about blessing me, and all this stuff, this theology that is not about the gospel, Paul is writing. Gospel will cost you something. It's not about what you get. It costs Jesus His life for us. It costs Paul physically. It costs Paul emotionally. It costs Paul a lot. It costs you. And it's going to cost me. Paul closes this out. and says, Listen, from now on, let no one cause me trouble. You know why? Because I bear the mark. Paul said, I bear the mark. You can see it. It's cost me something. So the question today I have is really three. You embracing your responsibility in the body of Christ. Not do you come to church. Not do you serve on a committee. Not do you do whatever. But, but, but are you embracing your responsibility in the body? Are you willing to disciple people? If you're walking in the Spirit, are you willing to take your communal responsibility serious? Second, what are you sowing? 
What are you sowing? What are you putting into the ground? What are you giving your time to? What are you giving your resources to? How are you walking? Are you walking in the Spirit? Are you expecting to receive a harvest of God? Or are you sowing that which will lead to destruction? Thirdly, you bear the marks of Jesus. You know, again, I think we've done an injustice of talking to people about this whole thing. We've made church a little bit about people instead of about Jesus. We, we've made it that, boy, if you'll just accept Christ, your life's going to be fantastic and all of this. It's about you, you, you. And Paul says that is not the gospel. Do you bear the marks? Paul physically bared the marks of persecution. Because he sowed to please the Spirit. Do you bear those marks of Jesus? In just a few minutes, my contact information is going to come up on the screen. And as you wrestle through these questions this week, I want to encourage you to reach out to me. I want to help get you in touch with others that can help you walk down this journey together. We'll be starting our new disciple-making triads at the first of the year, and we want to get you in one of those. We want to we want to take serious what it means to follow Christ, to be free in Christ, to so to please the Spirit. So as my contact information comes on as we sing our last hymn this morning, I want to encourage you just reach out, reach out, and and let's connect so that we can be people who individually make a decision to follow Christ, and together as the body, we so. pleasing to God. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word through Paul to the church in Galatia. God, we pray that we would be challenged this morning, that we would be willing to commit to live our lives for you. God, it's so easy to live to indulge the flesh, but today I pray, God, that we would be people who seek to please. God, may we be people who reap a harvest of righteousness. For your name's sake, that you would receive the glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. blood he gave to redeem now I belong to him now I belong to Jesus Jesus belongs to me not for the years of time alone but for eternity
Well, as we close this morning, I'm so thankful you joined us all the way up here in Alaska. Um, but uh, we'll, next Sunday, uh, Mike Bortz will be here as, as uh, he will bring the message. And uh, Sarah and I will begin our journey back home. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. As we close, I want to read a passage of Scripture as we began this book in Galatia. And I want to close with it today. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, in whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I hope you have a fantastic week. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving weekend. I look forward to seeing you. God bless you.